rally-ready Lamborghini, you say? Well, surely that's going to be some sort of Dakar spec Urus. Nah, it's way better than that. Say hello to the Lamborghini Huracan Storato. Now, we like Huracans here at Top Gear. They have the looks, they have the handling, and they have the noise. But what they don't have, despite most of them being four-wheel drive, is the ability to drive down a really bumpy back road at speed. Until now. Because the Lamborghini Huracan Storato is a special stage Lamborghini that is, in my humble opinion, just about perfect. The Storato is a car that Lamborghini says will be its easiest and most forgiving car to drive on low-grip surfaces. It references gravel and bumps quite a lot. And the quickest Lamborghini of all on a bumpy back road. A rally-style supercar? You have my complete attention. So what on earth have we actually got? Now, when I heard that Lamborghini was cooking up a special off-road version of one of its cars, I did assume that it meant its SUV, the Urus. But then it turned out they were actually playing with the venerable Huracan, a car that's been around since 2014. Uh, hence the slew of special editions, as it grows old absolutely disgracefully. But the good bits of the Huracan remain for the Storato, which means dirt road in Italian, by the way. So, what we have here is a 5.2 litre naturally aspirated V10 engine that pumps out 600 brake horsepower and redlines at 8,700 RPM and also has 413 pounds feet of torque. Now, to me, that sounds very much like the same engine that's in the Huracan rear wheel drive, so it's a fairly easy state of tune for this motor. Lamborghini does say that it has a specific engine calibration for the Storato, which I kind of assume just allows it to do what it does, which is beat it to hell without it puking its valves all over the roadway. Bolted to the back of that, you get the usual seven speed dual clutch transmission and Haldex Gen 5 four wheel drive, which all works very well in the standard car. Now, Lamborghini hasn't actually announced any performance figures for the Storato as yet, but seeing as the least fast Huracan gets from zero to 62 miles an hour in just over three seconds and does more than 200 miles an hour, I think it's safe to say that this will probably do zero to 62 in about three and a half and more than 180, which let's face it is probably enough. So the Storato is still really obviously a hurricane, but it's kind of an outdoorsy, rugged version that knows how to make a campfire out of three twigs and a flint. If we start at the front, it's got driving lights and a redesigned front bumper and side sills and a rear bumper that are all reinforced so that if you're clipping an apex, they won't get torn off like wet tissue paper. Then you've got a wider track with extended wheel arches, both front and back, roof bars, and this rather fetching snorkel, which keeps the engine fed with cold, clean air. Now, while that will help if you hit a water splash, it does not mean that you can use this Dorato as a submarine. At least I don't think so. But outright oomph really isn't the point of this Dorato. It's supposed to have a much broader spread of abilities than the standard car, and a lot of that is to do with suspension. If you want your Storato to do this, then it's going to have much more travel than usual. So there's these big wheel arch extensions that cover a track that's wider by 30 millimeters at the front and 34 millimeters at the back. But of more importance is a 44 millimeter increase in ride height. Now, I know that doesn't sound like much, but if you consider that the hydraulic nose lift on a standard car that raises it up so you can get over speed bumps is only 40 millimeters, that's gonna make quite a big difference. So the wheels, are actually quite small for a Lamborghini at 19 inches, but they come equipped with a much taller and very specific off-road tire. But the interesting thing here is that these wheels and tires have much more space to move because axle travel is up by 25% on the front axle and 35% on the back. So this car should go down a rough road much more easily. So what's it like on the inside? Well, the interior tends towards Hurricane, unsurprisingly. There's a permanent four-wheel drive system and a dedicated setup for the LDVI. That translates as Lamborghini Integrated Vehicle Dynamics, so you also get specific driving modes for the Anima, in this case Strada, Sport and Rally. The best bit of the setup is that Lamborghini actually mentions balanced oversteer for fun to drive characteristics, so I'm assuming that the Huracan's natural rear bias should be present and correct in Rally mode. 
It certainly appears so in the videos of the prototypes hooning around with mountain bikers. And the Storato isn't the only mutant sports off-roader to hit the market. Porsche has recently unveiled the 911 Dakar to a rapturous reception and quite a few orders. Which means that we may be entering the age of the off-road supercar. Can't wait for the group test. Or just the keys. Supercars, don't you just love them? Particularly love this burgundy Lamborghini Diablo, actually. The thing about supercars is that they are so seductive that every year there's another company, isn't there, that thinks they can build the next new great one. So allow me to introduce 2022's newest supercar. It is the Praga Bohema. Oof, they are not messing about, are they? Now, don't tell me, you're thinking, that's not a road car, mate, that is a racing car. And you do have a point, because up until recently, Praga has been making its name, building track-only racing cars. But I can prove this is street legal. It has indicators, there's somewhere to mount number plates, and later on, I can even show you that it has a superior infotainment touchscreen to a Volkswagen Golf. But before we do that, I should probably spend some time explaining where Praga has come from. The answer is Czechia, formerly known as the Czech Republic and Czechoslovakia before that. This landlocked nation of 10 million people bordered by Austria, Germany, Poland and Slovakia already has a proud car building history, thanks to Skoda of course. But it's not the first place that pops into mind when you think of Europe's supercar elite. However, Praga, named after the Latin name for the Czech capital city of Prague, has been around longer than Ferrari, Lamborghini and Maserati. It even makes Porsche look like a toddler. Founded way back in 1907, Praga has filled those 115 years building just about anything you can bolt wheels and engines to. Trucks, buses, motorbikes, aircraft, even tanks. It built its first car in 1911, but the story of the new Bohema kicks off when Praga went racing in 2011. About a decade ago, Praga started to put itself back on the map with notably small, lightweight racing cars like the R1, a little carbon fibre stealth bomber with a 365 brake horsepower Formula Renault engine in the back. But a true supercar needs really silly numbers, right? So the road car it's inspired has twice the power of the racing car. The engine then. Praga considered several for the Bohema. They actually got sign off from Audi to borrow their 5.2 litre naturally aspirated V10 from the back of an R8. But in the end, they went for the 3.8 litre twin turbo V6 you would normally find in the front of a Nissan GTR. It's actually the first time that Nissan have let another manufacturer officially use that monster of an engine. And Praga say they went for it, yes, because it's a little bit lighter and easier to package in the car than the big old V10, but mostly because, well, as I'm sure you know, it is hugely tunable. So the Praga spec V6s are actually going to be built in the UK by Litchfield Motors. And if you know anything about this engine, you'll know that Ian Litchfield's company absolutely put itself on the map by pulling massive amounts of brake horsepower out of this very engine. So you're starting off in the Behemoth in the kind of launch model, if you like, with 700 horsepower. But given what can be done with this motor, you'd have to say that the sky and, well, your bank account is the limit. 
Okay, the performance figures are still unconfirmed, but Praga's estimates sound a bit conservative to me. They're saying 0 to 62 miles per hour in under 3.5 seconds, which should be child's play for a 700 horsepower car that weighs less than a ton. The top speed is 189 miles an hour. But does this look like a car that's worried about the top speed wars to you? Well, here's a clue. Praga is claiming 900 kilograms of downforce at 155 miles per hour. Now, obviously you can see from the shape of this thing that what it's all about is downforce and aero. I mean, particularly here, it just screams mini Aston Martin Valkyrie to me. But it might surprise you that there is no active aero on this car. There's no pop-up flaps hidden under the front and that wing is fixed doesn't act as an air brake. And the reason for that is that would all need hydraulics and hydraulics add weight. And weight is an obsession for Praga to make this lighter than the supercars we're becoming used to. It's definitely gonna be under a ton. At the moment, the engineers say it's about 982 kilos, but they are still working on ways to shave off grams. And well, can I please show you all the details now? So naturally, as prescribed in the supercar rulebook, all the bodywork is carbon fiber, the brakes are carbon ceramic, but it's the little touches I love. Stuff like these beautiful carbon fiber aero covers over the front wishbones, and even this enormous mirror support here, carbon fiber and specially shaped to help funnel air as it plunges into the intake. Thing is though, Anyone can draw a car that looks fast. I mean, even I can do that and did plenty of it at school. It's designing a car that's fast and can still be used on the road. And remember, this is street legal. That is the tricky bit. So, some interesting points. Apparently, this front is going to get over a speed bump. You can drive the Behemoth in the rain because it has the world's most elegantly hidden windscreen wiper. Don't worry about there being no back window because it's got a reversing camera and the finished car will even have parking sensors. And there's even plenty of room for your luggage. Can you guess where? Nope, it's not in the nose. You open up your hidden side saddle, take out what looks like an overgrown violin case. And then if we just pop off all of these clasps, there you go, enough room for your helmets, your racing boots, your overalls, a pair of pants and a toothbrush. That is very, very nicely packaged indeed. Right, now it's time for the bit that I've been dreading, climbing inside. Ooh. Yeah, I have been having to um, yeah, limber up for this one. Another similarity with the Aston Martin Valkyrie is that this is a supercar that you pretty much need a climbing license to get into. So here's the technique. Open the door, make sure the steering wheel is already off and then sit on the intake here. Don't worry, it is designed for it. Then you gracefully swing your legs inside, plant them on a little footrest integrated into the seat. Then basically do a chest dip into the tub, slide your feet down onto the pedals and relax. And that is how you board a Praga Bohema. Okay, once you're inside, this is the technique for closing the door. Use one hand to pull it down and then the other hand to click it into place. Then you simply connect up your harness and attach the steering wheel, which goes on there. And then you adjust the steering wheel with a lever here. And there's one for the pedals as well, because of course the seat stays mostly fixed, though you can use a button here to change the angle of the backrest. Now, what a view this is. You can see perfectly the tops of the wheel arches, which really helps you place the car. And it feels incredibly narrow for a supercar as well. You've got a very, very narrow windscreen that reduces the frontal area and of course cuts your drag. And they've been able to do that because as you can see, the passenger sits slightly further back in the behemoth and that's not just for aerodynamics it's also just a bit of ergonomics it means you actually both get a bit of elbow room there's none of that annoying fighting like you get on an aircraft where you're arguing over the armrest 
What I really love though is the sort of laid back, slightly feet up nature of this driving position. It actually reminds me of lying down in the McMurtry Spearling. Building your own supercar is obviously very expensive, and that's why, even in the 1990s, Ferrari used buttons from old Fiat, and Aston Martin still borrows interior bits and bobs from Mercedes. So, fair play to Praga, everything in here is bespoke. The steering wheel is a mad shape, but it fits in your hands perfectly, and all of these carbon fibre buttons are unique. So what else? Well, you've got the indicators here, the horn, the flash, the slow people out of the way button, and even these wiper controls. They look so steampunk. Love them. Then down to my left down here, there are electric mirror adjusters. And then I love up here in the roof, you've got this aircraft style ignition switch, various other carbon fiber buttons, full heater and aircon rotary controls. But if you need to demist the windscreen, maybe it's a bit frosty before your commute, then you just hit the demist button down here. Also, all carbon fiber, that's right next to the hazards and the launch control. But if things have got a little bit too hot and bothered, then you flip off this metal cover, which looked like something off Batman's utility belt, and you hit that big red button for the fire extinguisher. Lastly, you heard me mention earlier that the Behemoth has a class-leading interior touchscreen, and I wouldn't lie to you. Um, here it is. Yep, you simply pull out this very elegant little spring-loaded phone holder, jam your chosen make in, it's completely compatible, Apple, Android, it doesn't matter. Then there's a convenient little USB socket just behind and your Praga is fully connected. Spotify, Google Maps, Waze, voice control, whatever you want, it's all there because it's all already in the best possible touchscreen you could want, your smartphone. I mean, forget supercars. I don't know why all car manufacturers don't just give up on touchscreens and do this. Volkswagen, are you listening? While we wait for me to climb back out, I had a quick chance to drive the Behemoth prototype at the Top Gear test track a couple of days before we shot this. The takeaways were that even on the bumpy access road, the suspension is freakishly compliant, the engine sounds angrier than any Nissan GTR, and it's incredibly friendly. The braking performance will pull your head off, the turning is electric, and even on a damp track, it had massive traction right up until I span it. So the traction control isn't quite idiot proof yet, but it's still a hugely promising underdog, and the cornering performance is proper hypercar level stuff. Problem is, yeah, the price, well, that is hypercar level as well. The Behemoth costs 1.1 million pounds plus taxes, and that is a lot of money. But to be fair, Praga's boss makes a good point that demand for crazy hypercars doesn't appear to be going anywhere but up right now. And look at the new toys on the block, the new McLaren Solus, that's for track only. And there's Adrian Newey's new RB18 Red Bull, and he wants five million pounds for one of those. Plus the behemoth will be rare and that matters. There's only 89 of these that are ever going to exist with the first 10 or so arriving with first customers next year, which ought to give them just enough time to start training their necks. The good news is that Praga is working on having the car certified not just in Europe, but in America, Asia and Australia. Plus, you get a two year warranty with 5,000 kilometers of track day cover. Oh, and the development driver is none other than XF1 and current IndyCar bloke, Roman Grosjean. Ooh la la. So there you go then, 2022's newest supercar. Does the world need another carbon fiber hypermissile? Well, you can argue no, but supercars, no matter how old they are, are always going to be super seductive and desirable. And you could argue that the rate at which technology is improving and also our times are changing right now, there's never been a better time to try and do a crazy supercar. And well, having driven this one, I can tell you there is huge potential in the behemoth. So good luck, Praga.
Do you want to know one of my favourite weird car world facts? Okay, every year more people buy the Porsche Macan than they buy 911s, Caymans and Boxsters put together. So that means that Porsche is more of an SUV maker than it is a sports car company. Weird. So what do you think would happen if Porsche took one of its sports cars and, well, introduced some off-roading superpowers? Well, you'd probably end up with something that looks exactly like this, wouldn't you? The new 911 Dakar. It's not often that we get an entirely new flavor of 911. Usually it's the same badges coming around on repeat. Carrera, Targa, Turbo, GT3, RS, and so on. But the Dakar, named after the gruelling cross-continental desert rally, is the newest Porsche collectors must have. Only two and a half thousand examples will be built, but Porsche is really struggling to get anyone interested. Ha, only joking. It's a limited edition Porsche, of course it's going to sell out immediately. So um, yeah, let's see what you're going to get for your 222,000 euros, starting with a really, really big towing eye. Apparently that is road legal. The bonnet comes from a GT3, that's why it gets nostrils in the middle and it's carbon fiber. New front bumper down here, much tougher looking design with this mesh to protect your radiators from getting punctured off road and then a stainless steel chin guard on the front. In fact, underneath the Dakar is all fully armor plated. That carries on to the wheel arches. You've got this tough, plastic extension off the side. Uh, this is a new color actually for the Dakar. It's called Shade Green. I think it looks absolutely tremendous. Porsche is doing really good work with colors right now. Out here at the back, new carbon fiber rear spoiler, fixed spoiler. Uh, this doesn't pop up and you don't get any active aero flaps at the front either. Porsche says that's because any of those intricate, delicate little mechanisms would just get smashed to pieces off-road, so they haven't bothered. And then lastly, round the back, another really, really big tough towing eye, and then this chunky bumper with holes to vent out the intercooler. Let's not hear anything, please, from Dakar owners about not wanting to take it off-road because they're worried about scratching it. It certainly looks tough enough. What else? Well, the ride height for one thing. Uh, the Dakar rides 50 millimeters taller than a normal 911 in its standard setting, but because it's got active suspension and lift systems at both axles, you can choose to put the car up on tiptoes and it will give you another 30 millimeters of suspension travel. Now, Porsche says that this is, and I quote, only for ambitious off-roading. Love the sound of that ambitious off-roading in your 911. And as if to prove that, the car will squat back down automatically once you take it over 105 miles an hour. Right, a quick rundown of the drivetrain. Basically, it's a 911 Carrera 4 GTS underneath. That means the three liter twin turbo flat six shoved up the Dakar's bum generates 475 brake horsepower and it's connected to an eight speed twin clutch flappy paddle gearbox. It'll get you from 0 to 62 miles an hour in 3.5 seconds using normal launch control, but there's a second launch control designed specifically for gravel that allows you 20% more wheel slip. Which is all jolly interesting, but my favorite nerd fact about this car is that it's the slowest Porsche 911 you can buy. In fact, in terms of top speed, the Dakar is probably the slowest 911 since the 1960s. It's been limited to 149 miles an hour flat out because if it went any quicker, it would start to rip its reinforced off-road tires apart. Talking of tires, these are Pirelli Scorpions. They've been developed specifically for the 911 Dakar to give decent on-road performance and apparently even handle the Nordschleife but they're also pretty much puncture resistant off-road and they are seriously chunky. I mean, look at those tread blocks and the sheer amount of sidewall you've got here. Uh, that's because the rims are actually pretty small for a modern sports car, 19 inches at the front and 20s at the rear. Now, you can spec normal Pirelli on-road tires for this car, but unless you are a complete poser, 
I just can't understand why you do that. I mean, that's like going to see a band live, paying for the ticket, and then just listening to them on your headphones instead. You do that, you're denying yourself the best part of the experience. And speaking of optional extras, as per usual with Porsche, the Dakar is a configurator addict's dream. You might be interested in having the roof rack, which can carry 42 kilos of Porsche branded stuff. It's also a mounting point for spotlights, which is why Porsche has thoughtfully integrated a 12 volt socket straight into the roof. Now don't worry if you've had to sell your house to afford the 200 grand asking price because there's an accessory for that as well. The official Porsche 911 Dakar roof tent. It's not on this car, but it's coming soon. I mean, that is genius, isn't it? You can enjoy the great outdoors or head off to a festival and you never have to worry that once it's time to go home, your car's gonna get stuck in the campsite. I've just spotted something I wanted to share with you, actually. Um, you probably imagine that Porsche have given us a lovely factory fresh beauty car to shoot in the studio today, or maybe a clay model. No, not a bit of it, okay? This thing has literally just got back from Morocco where it's been doing some hardcore desert testing. And you can tell that because look at the accessories up here. There's damage from the tires and it's still got your genuine Moroccan dirt embedded into it. They've actually been using this thing properly. And I love that. The ultimate optional extra though, will set you back about 26,000 euros. And it's this, the Dakar Rally Design Package, which gets you white wheels, two-tone white and blue livery with this red and gold striping, and your very own personal racing numeral painted on the door. Now, you could probably argue it's a bit dubious to have a new car dressed up in a cigarette sponsor's livery, but the 911s and the 959s that conquered the Paris-Dakar in the 80s are some of the coolest Porsche race cars of all time. So if any modern homage can get away with it, then this car can. Care to join me inside? Tell you what, I am getting big GT3 vibes in here. And that's because, well, when I look over my shoulder, there are no back seats. There is a roll cage and look at these proper carbon fiber bucket chairs because Porsche did want to save a bit of weight with this car. They're actually claiming it's 1,605 kilos, which is only 10 kilos heavier than a normal 911 GTS with four wheel drive and a flappy paddle gearbox. There's lots of little lightweight saving touches in here. Like, um, well, there's a lithium ion battery, saves a few kilos. Even the glass is thinner, save a bit more mass. And I thought, oh dear, I bet the refinement inside is awful with those big knobbly gnarly tires making a right old racket. But the engineers tell me that it is no worse in here when you're cruising than a normal 911 on winter tires. And the other thing is when they were doing some testing with this in Morocco, apparently, they were finding that the Dakar was running rings around Cayennes on the same terrain because it is so much lighter. It just floats over the dunes. As usual, you get a mode switch on the steering wheel to tell your Dakar how to behave. And it starts off very normal for a 911. There's wet mode, normal and sport. But then we get to the Dakar's new features. So first up, there's rally mode. And that tells the traction control and the suspension that you're on a loose surface and then sends most of the power to the back wheels, which just sounds hilarious. More serious is the final mode and that's off-road and that gives you maximum traction, maximum suspension, travel and ride height for conquering, well, just about anything. I mean, can you imagine how irritated the Land Rover Defender and Toyota Land Cruiser community would be if you brought one of these to their beloved off-road trails? Shall we just all agree to park that boring old cliche that says the Germans have no sense of humour? I mean, look at what just Porsche has given us so far this year. A 911 GT3 RS with a bigger spoiler than James Bond's dying. A GT4 RS that sounds like the end of the world rescored by Hans Zimmer. And now this thing, the 911 Zombie Apocalypse Edition. It's not bad going, is it really, for a company that mainly builds SUVs?
When someone one day writes the big definitive book of car history, well, the early years will belong to Germany for inventing the car, the 1910s, that's America falling in love with the Model T Ford, the 1970s, Japanese domination. But what about now, the 2020s? I think it belongs to the Koreans. This is a Hyundai. Hyundai started importing cars into the UK in 1982. And at first, they were pretty terrible comedy cars for cheapskates. Slowly, they graduated to making decent but dreary white goods for your grandparents. But in the past decade, something incredible has happened to Korean car makers. Kia started making good looking cars like the Sportage, the Proceed and the Stinger. Hyundai's become a hot hatch hit maker with brilliant N versions of the i20, i30 and Veloster. And both brands are now home to some of the coolest looking family electric cars around in the shape of the Kia EV6 and Hyundai's Ioniq. Okay, so here's just one example of what I'm on about, right? This is the BMW iX, BMW's idea of a modern, handsome SUV. Sorry if you're eating. And uh, yeah, this is the Hyundai Tucson. This is Hyundai's idea of a modern, handsome SUV, which looks like a concept car, which escaped from the design studio and went on the school run. It's a bit cyberpunk, it's cool, and well, it's confident. And it feels like, well, after a long time coming, Korean design is now making the European old guard look a bit silly. So does that mean that Korean cars can now do whatever the hell they like? A proper sports car, retro looks, motorsport potential, a powertrain from the future? Well, how about all of those things in one car? The Hyundai N Vision 74. If you're seeing some Gijaro 1970s influences, you're quite right. This is inspired by a 1974 concept car, hence the name. Maybe you're seeing some DeLorean influences, the sharp creases, that shuttered rear window, the narrow snout. It's all in there, isn't it? But unlike most concept cars, what's under the skin is just as interesting here. You see, this is a hydrogen hybrid, part fuel cell, part electric. Let me explain. At the back, you'll find two electric motors. They generate a combined 670 brake horsepower, which is why this car is apparently a bit of a drift monster. They draw their power from a 62 kilowatt hour battery like a normal electric car. And when it runs low, you can plug it into the wall and charge it up. So far, so 21st century. But the bit that's from the future is the onboard electricity power station. You see, Hyundai's also plumbed in a hydrogen fuel cell, which has been quietly working away on for the past few years, trying to make it as small and light as possible. The hydrogen fuel tanks weigh just 4.2 kilos and can be fully refueled in five minutes to give you another 370 miles of all electric range. Because the 74 is rear wheel drive only, as the sports car gods intended, Hyundai's had some fun with it. Because you've got individual motors for each rear wheel, it can do things like torque vectoring. So carve a tighter line if you're going for the best possible lap or just throw all of the power at the inside rear wheel and kick it out into a big smoky drift. They're saying it's got 664 pounds feet and could top out at 155 miles an hour. If Marty McFly had had one of these, Back to the Future would have been a much shorter film. So I'm afraid we've now arrived at that point of the video where I say, unfortunately, the N Vision 74 is incredibly fragile and furiously expensive. So wasn't it jolly nice of Hyundai to let us take a look at it? But um, like and subscribe and goodbye. Except because the Koreans are living their best car life right now, this is not just a model. It drives, it's really fast, and they say I can take it out on track. So um, I'm gonna go and put a really ugly helmet on. Right, welcome to Bilsterberg. Probably the scariest racetrack you've never heard of. Built on an old British Army Cold War munitions base that some mad baron decided to turn into a race resort designed by Herman Tilke. Brought you a lot of boring F1 circuits, didn't he? But he really, really got his act together for this place. It's like all the scary bits of the Nürburgring knitted together and it only takes two minutes to get round rather than 10. So, a good place to drive a priceless concept car, which they've only got one of drivable in the world. I'm at an old army base, 
and I'm in a hydrogen powered weapon. Okay, what can I tell you about it? Well, basically, it feels like a racing car. It feels stiff, it feels unyielding. I've been told to stay off the curves because this thing is fragile, but even though it's got power steering, lovely sense of connection coming back through this. We go flat shut down the straight, that's 110 miles an hour. Feels fast, brakes are fantastic. There's no sense of any regen nonsense spoiling your confidence. In fact, this i30M that's being driven by a race driver in front of me is holding me up. Come on, man, get out of the way. From inside, a hydrogen car just feels like an electric car. There's no sense of weird science going on behind me. It just feels like I've got loads of torque, electric motors, there's a lot of hissing and fans happening in the background, but I'm not really aware of that. I'm just aware of having to catch the slides because this thing's got serious amounts of torque. And because of those rear electric motors, it can simulate a limited slip differential, but it can react so much faster. So it's like the best limited slip diff you could imagine. When manufacturers really get on top of these things, I think we're really, really gonna have some fun with them. Yeah, priceless concept car, so what? If you set it up to drift, I'm gonna try and drift it. Oh, there's so much elevation change down here. That bit's blind. Slight lock up there, but just turn it in on the nose. There you go. That's a confidence inspiring car for you. One and a half laps round an absolutely pad wetting circuit. Got a bit of tire temperature and you can just lob it around. Okay, so now going into the track mode, I'm gonna let the pace car get away from me on the straight here because I really wanna feel what this thing can do when it's let off its electronic leash. So let's just drop back. Hopefully the pace car is not noticed, I'm dawdling. And off we go. Wow, that is so fast. Try not to outbreak myself into turn one. Oh, that was a bit late on the brakes. Got it back. Oh, it's so progressive on the throttle. The only problem is that with no engine noise, you can't really hear like when your revs are spiking. The first thing you know about overwhelming the rear tires is when you sort of start banging your head on the roll cage and looking out of the side window. Oh yes, this is a fun chassis. Oh yes, Hyundai, where has this come from? They've conquered hot hatches, and now they're having to go at rear drive. I mean, no one is safe, are they? BMW M, AMG, even Porsche. I need to take some notice, guys, because this thing is gonna come for you. And all too soon, it's over. Back into the pits at Bilsterberg. Me and the N Vision 74 have survived. I'm gonna give it back to Hyundai now. I hope they don't put it in a museum. I hope they take this gorgeous body, stick it in a garage, work out how to put it into production and give it back to me in a few years with some number plates on it. Well done to the Hyundai technicians. This thing, if it's a glimpse of the future, is one that I'm here for. Well, I enjoyed that, but I'm afraid you're gonna to have to take my word for it because the 74 isn't a car that Hyundai is selling to the public anytime soon. It's a rolling laboratory, experimenting with what they can do with hydrogen, with the packaging, with the cooling, for if they need it in the future. But I hear you, you wanna know what the immediate future of Hyundai's go fast N division is? Well, that's to go electric. So let me show you this. Feast your eyes on the RN22E. Rubbish name, but an interesting car, because it's kind of a cross between the Ionic 6 streamlined saloon and an electric touring car. Now we know that the first hot N car from Hyundai's souped up division will be a new Ionic 5 with more power, but I think a 577 horsepower dual motor super saloon could be a fun place to go next. So um, let's take it for a drive. Okay, leaving the pit lane again in Bilsterberg. Already, this car makes a heck of a lot more noise than the uh, 74 did. This is a very different kind of car. This is Hyundai's answer to a Porsche Taycan, I guess. Dual motor, electric super saloon, 577 horsepower. They've asked me to leave the traction control on because this is potentially even more valuable. So what have we got spec-wise? Well, we've got 
beefier brakes because of course heavy electric cars get brake fade on track. We've got this variable torque split so we can play with the power across the axles. That's already good fun to me. Obviously got lots and lots of aero too. Car feels very neutral, very responsive. It's much less tail happy than the 74 was. Of course, we've got drive going to the front wheels. Just feels like you can mash it. But Hyundai's adamant they're not doing EVs that are just fast in a straight line, that are about winning drag races to annoy people on YouTube who've got muscle cars. This is supposed to be just as good in the corners. And even though I'm not supposed to slide it around, the car wants to. It's hilarious, isn't it? Yet again, Korea has tried to build an elegant design study and they've accidentally built a bloody racing car. Woo. Now, more about this simulated shift. Yes, it's fake. Yes, it's just software. But I and I say, A, hey, it's fun to listen to something. And also, it's kind of helpful for my caveman brain. You see, normally when you're driving an EV, you've got no audio reference of what the powertrain's doing. But in this, because I can hear the revs, well, hear what the revs would sound like if it had a big petrol engine. And because I'm getting engine braking and then these little surges on the upshift, now I'm downshifting. Look, engine braking there and there. It's like grabbing third, then second gear. Just gives you something to kind of lean against. It's weird, it's so difficult to explain, but it does just feel, whoa, that was really lively through there. It just feels like you're driving a car with a responsive paddle shift gearbox. Okay, it's just the software, it's just the zeros and ones making that happen, but I'm already finding this very intuitive and very easy to use, which is kind of funny given it's a priceless semi-race car concept one-off. And there you go, I hit the rev limiter there. I'm making mistakes, EVs, EVs do everything for you and I find that boring. This car, well, I've already cocked up in it. You just saw me hit the rev limiter. I was a bit slow downshifting just there. It's letting me kind of make mistakes. I got some understeer there. This might be the most interactive EV I've driven. I'm actually, I might have to shut up now and concentrate. Oh, it feels lively. It feels like a kind of really glued down hot hatch, but with the new RS3's drift mode in it, but massively better throttle response. It's a really, really impressive bit of kit, this. I just hope that lessons from this do go into that Ionic 5N that we know is coming. This is gonna go on to become an electric touring car, and then maybe, maybe we will get an Ionic 6N. Maybe we'll start to get excited about electric performance cars after all. I didn't expect to be that impressed today, but as you can probably tell from my giddy laps, I enjoyed myself. But what really blows my mind is the sheer scope of everything that Hyundai is trying right now. A bit of retro flavor or a modern design, a bit of hydrogen fuel cell, awesome electric, and their petrol cars are bloody good fun as well. So while everyone else worries about how to do a driverless car, Hyundai is going to concentrate on making the fleshy human behind the wheel have some fun. So that chapter then on the Koreans taking over the car world should be a really enjoyable one, as long as stuff like this gets built. I knew it was coming, you knew it was coming, we all knew it was coming, didn't we? But here it is, the brand new 911 GT3 RS. And it's not messing about, is it? In fact, I'm slightly worried it's gonna headbutt me in a minute. Now, if you thought that car over there, the GT3 was extreme, this is the car that makes it look like a bit of a wuss. So here's everything you need to know about the new 992 generation 911 GT3 RS. Let's get the pub ammo out the way first, shall we? Power comes from a naturally aspirated four litre flat six producing 518 brake horsepower. Paul says it'll hit 184 miles an hour flat out, with 0-62 taking just 3.2 seconds. For comparison, that's only a 15 horsepower bump over the GT3, mainly thanks to new hotter camshaft, 0.2 seconds quicker from 0-62 than the GT3, and 14 miles an hour less at the top end. 
because of extra drag from the wing and the extra width and a shorter overall gear ratio for the PDK gearbox. So yes, this has some of the most senior stats of any 911 to date, but a GT3 RS has always been about more than just the numbers. Note how it hasn't gone power crazy. It's only got, I say only, just over 500 horsepower because that is the perfect amount of power for this particular application. In fact, let's find out how we got here, shall we? The RS lineage goes all the way back to the 1972 2.7 RS, a total honey to drive and knocking on the door of one million pounds now for the very best examples. But the first GT3 RS was the 2003 996. Originally intended as a homologation special, they eventually built 680 with fewer than 120 of those coming to the UK. Next up was the 2006 997.1 GT3 RS and it was a revelation. Wider, over 400 horsepower from its 3.6 litre engine, it was raw and mechanical and brilliant to drive. Except the 997.2 that arrived in 2009 was better. The engine grew to 3.8 litres and so did the legend. For many, this is considered peak GT3 RS, from the quality of the damping to its eagerness to attack any road or track. Then the legendary 4 litre version with 493 horsepower miraculously improved on perfection. In 2015, the 991.1 GT3 RS was the point where Porsche got serious about aerodynamics. It was also the point it introduced the PDK gearbox into the formula. It was less raw, more polished, but still magnificent. The 991.2 car brought new suspension for a more precise front end. By this point, there are no quirks that you have to drive around, just a hardcore focus on speed. Which brings us to the next chapter. And we start at the front with the radiators. Hear me out, it's more exciting than it sounds because you see every road going 911, like the GT3 over there, has three radiators in the front, whereas this just has one much larger angled radiator under there. It's the same solution that you get in the 911 RSR and the GT3 R race cars, and there are pros and cons to this. Uh, on the downside, you lose your frunk, you don't get any storage under there. So anything you bring along for the ride is gonna have to be wedged into the roll cage behind you. But the positives are it frees up space either side. So you can have active aero elements in the front splitter. Now those are constantly working with the active rear wing to create 70% downforce at the rear and 30% downforce at the front. Why do we want that? Well, it means whatever speed you're going into a corner, the car should feel the same. The balance of the car should stay the same. It should stay level. And that, in turn, should breed confidence. But here's where it gets complicated because all that warm air from the radiator has to go somewhere. And what you don't want is for it firing straight over the top of the car, down and into the engine intakes. You want cooler air for the engine, which creates more power. So what they've done is created these special aero add-ons here. Now this little lip, that creates an area of low pressure behind it, which sucks the air out of this nostril. And then there's these veins here and another vein under the mesh, which you can't see, which throws the air and accelerates it out towards the side of the car. But the crafty air wants to come back and it wants to reattach to the rear screen and go back into the engine around here. So that's where these fins come in to keep the air separated. So you get all the benefits of that single radiator in the front and you've got your engine running on nice, fresh, cool air at the rear. Genius. Clearly, aero is the name of the game here. There's a splitter up front now, not a spoiler, to divert air over and underneath, while side blades fire it outwards. Louvres in the front wheel arches and 911 GT1 inspired vents behind the front wheels release pressure in the front arch, while side blades direct air along the side of the car. Even the suspension gets the aero treatment. Longer double wishbone arms have teardrop shaped profiles to add 40 kilograms of downforce at top speed. The spring rates are also 50% stiffer than a GT3. In terms of wheels, you've got 20 inch rims at the front, 21 inch at the rear, and then you've got a choice of three wheels. So these are the lightweight forged aluminium wheels. You can tell they're lightweight because they've got these holes in them. And then you've got the standard uh, forged aluminium wheels and then the magnesium rims, which you can only get if you fork out for the Visac pack. 
In terms of brakes, this car here has carbon ceramics on it, but you can also get steel brakes as standard, slightly thicker discs than you get on the GT3, but let's face it, if you're a GT3 RS customer, you're probably gonna go for the carbon ceramics. Oh, and this is a nice little feature down here. You probably wouldn't even notice it if it was pointed out and if it wasn't lit up, but just there between this side blade and the bodywork is an indicator, a side repeater, very nicely hidden away. What have we got here? Some more aero shenanigans. So this space here, this hole, is exactly the same one as you get on the 911 Turbo, but it has a different function. Here, it's about reducing drag. So the air that goes into here is accelerated into this rear wheel arch, which in turn reduces drag. But of course, all that air has to be ejected somewhere. So you've got this cutaway rear arch, you've got this side blade, which funnels some of it around the side of the car, but you've also got two more little vents here, one at the top, one at the bottom. Now, there's a good story about this because Andreas Preuninger absolutely hates fake vents. So this one at the top is real. There's mesh there, I can feel it. Air actually comes out of there. But this smaller lower section is not a vent. So he's written on it, no vent. So there can be no arguments whatsoever. If we come around the back, we've got three things we need to talk about. The first is the width of this thing. It is 29 millimeters wider than a GT3. And then there's the diffuser, which is a slightly modified version of the diffuser you get on the GT3. And the third thing, what is the... Oh yes, this massive rear wing that completely dominates the entire car. Now this is a swan neck spoiler, just like the one you get on the GT3, but it's obviously been scaled up to comic book proportions. In fact, when this section of the wing is in its uppermost setting, it's actually taller than the roof line of the car, which is a first for a production Porsche. So what do we have here? We have a two part wing. You've got the fixed section at the bottom and then this movable element at the top, it moves via hydraulics. And what that means is that Porsche has basically fitted an F1 style DRS system to a road car, to a car that normal people like you and I can just go out and buy and drive. It's insane. So what exactly does DRS do? Well, if you want to overtake a rival or show off on a straight, you can push a button and the wing will flatten itself, reducing drag and letting you go faster. On the flip side of that, if you need to stop in a hurry, the movable elements of the wing rise up and act as an air brake to slow you down like a really, really expensive sail. At 124 miles an hour, this GT3 RS produces 409 kilograms of downforce, which is twice as much as the old GT3 RS and three times as much as the GT3 over there. And that's not exactly a streamliner, is it? It also produces 860 kilograms of downforce at 177 miles an hour. It wouldn't be a modern 911 without drive modes and things to adjust, but this takes things to a whole new level, making chassis adjustments easy and accessible. You don't need a spanner and a jack or to get your hands dirty, you just need your fingers to twiddle four dials on the steering wheel. You can even make tweaks on the fly while you're still rolling out on track. And this is where all the twiddling occurs via these four dials that have magically sprung up on the wheel in front of me. And the first one you want to care about is drive mode. So you've got three modes, normal, sport and track, put it into track and that then unlocks the functionality in these other dials. So the first one we're gonna play with is called PASM. If we click that, all the dials now change their functionality and you can individually change the compression and rebound on the front and rear suspension. It's just astonishing. Now this one down here is marked PTV+. Plus. That is your e-diff. So if I click that, I can now change the coast and power functions. That's basically dictates the car's behavior on the entry to a corner and then on the exit of a corner as well. And then this one is the ESC and traction control button. So if I click that, I've got seven stage traction control. And if I want to turn everything off, I've got to change my ESC mode to off and then I can turn it all off. All very exciting. This button here, that's marked DRS. So your movable rear wing, your flaps in the front spoiler, they will constantly be altering to try and keep that 70% rear, 30% front aero balance that I mentioned earlier, but you can override it. So if you're on a straight and you want the wing fully open, you can hit this button and you can hit it again to make the wing fully closed. What else can I tell you? Oh yes, sadists out there, 
I've got some bad news. Unfortunately, because the electronics and the integration of screens in modern Porsches are just too complicated, there is no option in this car to delete the infotainment and delete the aircon. So, sorry guys, you're gonna have to put up with a screen and aircon. Shame. Being an RS, it's not gonna be chunky. Thanks to lightweight materials like carbon fiber reinforced plastic or CFRP being used in the doors, wings, roof and bonnet, for example, it weighs 1450 kilograms with fluids. That's only 45 kilograms heavier than the lightest spec Lotus Amira. Now, you can get a club sport pack as a no cost option and that adds the steel roll cage that we got in the back here, a fire extinguisher and six point harnesses which this car doesn't seem to be fitted with. Or you can go the whole hog and step up to the Visac pack. Now that adds a loads more carbon fiber elements, a load more exposed carbon fiber on various components around the car and does cut a significant chunk of weight. And you can have PDK paddles with magnets in them for the ultimate crisp gear shift. Very underrated attribute that one. It's all very impressive when you see it in person, but if you're going to learn all there is to know about a new Porsche GT car, there's only one man you need to talk to, and it's not me. It's Andreas Preuninger. Andreas, thank you so much for having us back again. Welcome to Weissach. Yeah, this is amazing. I, I prefer this to a studio environment. You know, well, me too. <laughs> yeah, it's your office, right? Yeah. You work well, it's close day. by. I um, spend a lot of time here, yeah. Cool. Now, when we, um, when we spent some time in the studio with the GT4 RS, I remember you saying, well, just wait until you see the GT3 RS and you weren't joking, this thing is, it's completely wild. But my, I suppose my first question is, who's this car for? Can you really drive this thing on the road? Is it too extreme? Um, it depends, <laughs> but um, uh, the, the customer group, the target group is clearly the track enthusiast. Yeah, yeah. Um, the people that uh, attend track days that use their car as an instrument, as a tool uh, for doing, uh, let's say, homemade racing or sort of racing uh, in a, in a semi-professional way. Um, if you look at the thing, it, 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 it's, it's obvious. It's a, it's a race car with a license plate attached <laughs> more than ever. Mm -hmm. And the aero concept, the whole shape of the car, the whole, the, the, the whole uh, way it comes across, it's race car and it's very radical. It looks more um, wild and extreme than many uh, actual race cars of the GT3 class. It's really a tool for the racetrack, for the people that are already a little bit into it. Maybe it drove the actual GT3 RS and they will uh, see they can make progress yeah. when they go to the new car because there's more adjustments, more aero, more of everything, more contact patch. We're really concentrated on this car, on giving the utmost uh, for the customer that really does track days. Not so much like a GT4 RS to enjoy a mountainous road and uh, to do a Sunday drive with the car um, on a B road. That's maybe not what we're aiming at with that car. Mm -hmm. It can be done and it's yeah. more fun than you could think of because it, it, it really behaves very well in the street mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, it's, a, it's as close to a race car as you can get with a license plate attached. So I'll go with a difficult question early on. How much further can you push the RS brand before you are literally just fitting airbags to, a, to an RSR race car? Um, that would be great if we could do that on the legal side, which we can't. I mean, this is what we can do right now with mm -hmm. the boundary conditions that we have from the regulation side, from technology available. And um, to be frank with you, I can't, can't think of anything uh, to do for a second generation that um, we still have in the, in the drawer that we hold back. We should be, we, should we be put everything way. in that car right now um, that we know from racing and that we think is good for a car like that. Is this peak, I know when we were talking about the GT4 RS, you talked about this engine and you know putting the GT3 engine in the back of the Cayman, something you wanted to do for so long. And actually we know that the combustion engine only has a certain shelf life on this earth. So well, let's wait and see. Yeah, yeah, I know you've got ideas to keep it alive for a long time now, but do you feel we're sort of in this kind of peak combustion era where it's like... I don't think we're in a peak combustion era. I don't want to talk about future strategies mm. or whatever, or technology in general. Um, but the problems the, 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 the combustion engine right now faces is the, the law situation all around. Mm -hmm. the, the emission standards sure. that are getting, getting, uh, getting dialed down all the time. And uh, for a normal combustion engine with 50 horsepower, that might be okay. But we're talking a high revving motorsport product here mm -hmm. uh, that uh, should be street legal. And this is not a challenge. It's not a technology. I mean, the combustion engine in itself for making more power, for being, being a companion for a long time uh, would be easy. 
uh, without the boundary conditions, which we have to accept, though. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, I love the fact that this has got 518 brake horsepower. It's 525 uh, in, in Europe or yeah. in, in the rest of Europe. Well, 15, um, so it's 15, 15 over on, that. On the GT3. Uh, yeah. But I love that, you know, because honestly, that, that 500 horsepower or just above, that's, that's the sweet spot. Right for these types I, of cars. I think so. I think mm. so because uh, it's it's relatively easy to gain straight uh, line performance and just upping the power and mm. putting turbos on it or whatever. But that means weight as well, mm. especially turbocharging an engine. We've got an atmospherical engine, a high revving, a normal aspirated engine. That's exactly what our customer expects from yep. us. And this technology has a limit uh, when it should be street legal and last for a lifetime, mm -hmm. which that thing can yeah. can because it's bulletproof. Mm -hmm. And um, we concentrated rather on making, um, uh, making better track times with the rest of the car, uh -huh. which is aero, which is body in white, which is suspension, with this contact patch, which is uh, systems that you can operate as a driver. Uh, still, the engine is not the same engine as in GT3. We've got uh, hotter cams, cams with higher duration, so the, um, the, uh, the, the, the behavior beyond 6K RPM to the red line of 9 is a little bit more ferocious even than on GT3, more than you, more than you would think with only 15 horsepower more. Yeah. Um, uh, we have different cylinder heads, we have uh, different intake systems, so it's not the same engine, mm. um, but it's a very close relative. And we've got a GT3 over there just for, just for reference. Hi just, hey, yeah. how you doing? Just, to, you know, just a little prop for us over there. So, come on, give us some sort of flavor of lap time. You know, the, the, as you say, the engines are very different, but in terms of um, playing power, they're not so different. How much faster can this thing go? Depends on the conditions, depends on the track, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. I mean, we haven't had the chance to uh, do a fastest lap on the Nürburgring yet mm -hmm. because uh, there was some, some, uh, some um, parts missing and there were, the dates not correct and the weather was super hot. Yeah. Super hot weather is not exactly the best, <laughs> the best condition for, uh, for, for, for getting a clean, uh, fast lap because the hotter it is, the less oxygen you've got in the air. Sure. It's not a turbo engine that mm -hmm. can compensate it with higher boost. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we, we were on it and I think uh, when we meet each other driving the car in Silverstone later that year, we'll have the times and uh, it'll be substantially quicker than a GT3 as a matter of fact. Oh, I can't wait, I but, can't wait. The power I mean, of downforce. The, po the, the power of downforce, the contact patch, everything. Okay, this car has more coefficient drag, logically. It has three times the downforce than a GT3, which has a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, so it costs top speed. So the longer straights uh, on, on the Autobahn, the GT3 is faster. Mm -hmm. But we don't care about top speed. Uh, we care about the highest possible speed you can reach on the fastest track, which is the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Yeah. Um, on a Döttinger straight, it goes 285, 290, something like that. And then we have two horses sitting on the roof, 860 kilos of downforce on the car as soon as you hit, a, hit, hit, the, hit the, the ditch or go into the curve, yeah. which is a, um, a sus substantial enabler for fast lag lap times. Yeah. Which is the perfect segue to talk about the DRS system, because yeah, you're obviously looking at this equation, all this extra downforce that helps you in the corners. But if you, if you want a really hot lap time, you, a few extra mile an hour on the straights makes a big difference. So how long oh, have you wanted to fit a DRS system to a road car? It must have been an idea in your head. For I always found it fascinating in Formula One because it gives the driver something to play with. And I tell you, even on the Autobahn, on the de-restricted MD Autobahn, it, it, it plays such a big role, a lot bigger than I thought, actually, mm. until I tried it. Yeah. Because if, you, if you're going really quick and there's a curve coming, and you kind of start to think, will I lift or will I go? Mm -hmm. And um, the only solution is press DRS and the car is like settling down. Yeah. It, you can feel it, how it hunkers down, like as if it would click in a rail system. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and you can reach uh, speeds comfortably, easily, without any danger that haven't been there before in the kernels. And, and that's why the car is so fast on the track. I mean, yeah. with that setup, with a Cup R compound tire, which is available at the dealerships, in some high-speed corners, that thing on a Cup R tire is faster than a Cup car, a current Cup car on slicks. It's insane. Yeah, and so they, they, everybody should train them neck muscles a little bit, like the Formula <laughs> One drivers. You'll be able to spot a GT3 RS driver from you know across the bar because he'll be there. Yeah, okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> now with the GT4 RS, the noise, obviously the intake system, that was its big party trick. You could yeah. say the DRS is this car's party trick. Is there anything? Um, additional you've done with the sound of this car other than just, just you know, you've um, got 9,000 RPM. I think 
the rear engine, the rear engine setup on a GT3 sounds spectacular. Mm. And uh, the same goes for this car. It has even a little bit less insulating material. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a little bit more coming across uh, from, of intake and of exhaust noise. We don't have the, uh, the, the intake uh, um, system like on a, on a GT4 RS, so the sound is bespoke GT3 RS, yeah. which I think is good because mm -hmm. everybody said, oh, the 4 RS sounds completely different than this one, yeah. despite having the same engine. That's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So every car should have its own characteristics. Mm -hmm. This car definitely lives from, from, its, from its body, from its looks, from its stance, from its aerodynamical concept, mm -hmm. um, from the way the driver can influence the drive systems. Mm -hmm. You can influence uh, rebound and, uh, and compression mm -hmm. of, the, of each four of the, of the, of the dampers. Or from the steering by, wheel? By turning a knob from the steering wheel with a dial, you can adjust the, the, the diff, you can adjust traction control and everything very neatly. Uh, it's, 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 it helps really to find your own best setup. You don't have to crawl around on the floor and doing <laughs> clicks. And after, after one lap getting back, no, that was not correct, and, and try again. So yep. it it's makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So the technology that we involved in that car is, is, is really a super, a lot of, of innovations, like the door is carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. We never had a carbon fiber door in a street legal car. And it's not the same door sure. that we have in a cup car. In the cup car, you don't have to safety uh, the safety concerns in a, on a streetcar and you've got these crossbars here and um, this is a real carbon fiber door and it is an enabler for the aerodynamics because we have we, we needed a different shape to vent uh, the the wheelhouses here to get the air out like on a yeah. gt1 back then yeah. it seems like this car's entire mission is to get air out you know yeah. out of the art out yeah. of the top of here yeah. out of the um, i tell you what the, the air is it. really frightened <laughs> <laughs> when it hits that car it yeah. needs escape hatches yeah. so this is the per this is the perfect chance then why don't you just walk me through a few of your favorite bits where you've really moved the needle on this car i mean the special bits uh, like i said before we needed enablers uh, to 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 be able to uh, realize such a radical aerodynamic concept the cooler system uh, Look at this, so the, we have a central radiator in the front of the car, like on a GT3R, mm -hmm. like on the RSR even, so that's a pure motorsport part and mm -hmm. it's a motorsport technology. Um, that way we could um, leave away the outer two radiators that we have in the GT3, for example, mm -hmm. and on the predecessor GT3 RS, enabling us to fit in aerodynamic modules underneath the headlights that are work in synchronization with the rear flap, which is not only zero or 100, mm -hmm. it's, it's infinitesimal, it, go, it goes, goes all the way, and it's uh, perfectly in balance with the front modules, which couldn't have been there when we would have had coolers here. Sure. So even the radiator concept is something, something like a product out of the aerodynamic needs. So we needed a very efficient cooler, it has 40% more efficiency than the three cooling unit on the, on the GT3, which is needed because the surface of the three coolers are a lot bigger than the surface of only one cooler yeah. here, which is a big one, but you have to overcompensate the size yeah, for more efficiency. Uh -huh. And that was something that was difficult, but um, uh, now the car is, is from the cooling side completely healthy. You do, of course, you, you lose your luggage space. You lose the luggage here. space, but you have luggage space behind the seats. Oh, so there we go. Most yeah. of the RS owners I know, they have their <laughs> stuff anyways in the yeah. cabin. Yeah, but sorry for that, but uh, <laughs> that's a surprise for having this, this extremely uh, extremely astonishing aerodynamics on the car. Mm -hmm. And if and if the most important thing to you is space for a bag in the front nose. Absolutely. There's so, a car and, over and, there. And we offer a roof rack as well yeah. uh, to put your stuff on. <laughs> no, and um, you were asking about the, 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 the things that... Yeah, the, the, I have to say these, yeah. when, I, when I first saw pictures of it, my computer, these leapt out. They give it a really different look and character at the front, but of course, Nothing's just stuck on for looks. I have, th this has a purpose, as, yeah. you, as you might imagine. It's not the most beautiful part on the car. Um, we tried, we tried, we tried, and this is what came out. It's really function, but we need it, because why? Because the air enters here, exits behind the radiator here, hot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And without that, it would go straight over the roof, mm -hmm to the intake of the engine. So you're trying to we, send it out towards me over we here. We have to get the air away from the engine's uh -huh. intake, which is in the middle, which sits in the middle of the car. So this vein that you see here, this blade, uh -huh. directs the air a little bit to the outside, coming, coming up, and this boomerang, we call it, uh -huh. uh, does the rest in guiding the air all around the car. The good thing is, even in winter time, we always have it warm in the cabin <laughs> when you put the windows down, because the hot air is coming by here, but wood, try to get into the middle of the car here again. And that's mm -hmm. why these fins are for, to guide the air away from the, from, from the, from the center of the intake. Fantastic. This is how this two, this two um, 
plastic parts um, work together. And yeah. they're needed. Take those away and take the boomerang away, more than 20 horsepower less. That's fantastic. Yeah. And because the I'm air is just hotter that the engine has to intake. Am I right that even the wishbones on the suspension are profiled to yeah. add downforce? We have a double wishbone front <laughs> axle here. They're not the same parts in the GT3s, it's oh. the same principle. Uh -huh. But uh, every wishbone, every steering rod, every, every um, connecting rod is shaped like a wing. Yeah? Yeah. And um, it, it looks spectacular. <laughs> I would like to have this transparent uh, to show yeah. it off. It's like in a Formula One car, you see it as well. Mm -hmm. And it makes 40 kilos of downforce attacking directly at the suspension joints, exactly oh. where we want it. Yeah. 40 kilos. We always have to look very hard for downforce in the front because we want to keep the balance of, of the car 70% in the back, 30% at the front. Mm -hmm. Stable, always. Yeah. That's why we have to move this uh, adjustable so, uh, diffuser yeah. in synchronicity with the rear flapper. Wow, there's a lot going on. So, yeah. in, terms of, in terms of specs then, uh, Club Sport is, is the standard, standard. car. Right. Club Sport is standard. So what, what, what do you get with this, the standard kind of spec and then, and then we'll talk a bit about the Visac pack and how we step up. The standard spec, if you want to have the roll cage, you get it. Oh, it's mm -hmm. included in the car. Not our American customers. Um, that's a pity, but uh, the regulations in the US doesn't allow to have a roll cage in the car in a, in a GT3. Um, but it normally comes standard with the, uh, with, the, with the RS pack. Yeah. You can opt for one without if you need the luggage space. Yeah. And um, you have, uh, you have the, the, seat, the seat harness, the six-point harness that you need, and uh, the provision to uh, make an make a, make a, um, emergency uh, cutoff uh, cut switch uh -huh. uh, for, for, uh, for racetrack use. Uh -huh. That's mainly uh, and a fire extinguisher. Okay. Yeah. That is mainly what the club sport package exists, uh -huh. uh, consists of. And then the Visac pack, when you step up to that? The Visac pack, um, I mean, this is the subtle version of the yeah, car. Yeah, I, I mean, I, the walked, car I, said, I walked in that door, I barely noticed it. Yeah, like, I mean, where's the, the new car? Oh. That's the car that really blends in on a day in, the, in, in London with yeah. a lot of traffic. No, not kidding. Um, the Visac package shows more exposed carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. All these parts are carbon fiber, but they're painted. The Visa package will have a hood, like on the predecessor, that is uh, in carbon fiber, but will feature stripes mm -hmm. exiting here, this, uh, this, 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 this air vent in the exterior color. So it well, will be two stripes in exterior color there. It looks very good. Mm -hmm. The roof will be exposed carbon fiber. Uh, the rear lid will be carbon fiber mm -hmm. as well, or then the rear lid, so then the rear flap here, the movable yeah. part of the wing, mm -hmm. will be carbon fiber. And the cool thing is, on the Visa package, there's a Porsche sticker underneath ah. that you can only see when you go in high downforce. <laughs> so when you hit the brakes. When you hit the Porsche. brakes, yeah. <laughs> By the way, yeah. hitting the brakes, doing this active air brake thing, mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, is producing two and a half meter less distance than stopping from 200 to zero. That's wow. a lot. And even more difference. when you go faster. It makes really a yeah, difference. Yeah. It makes really a difference. Yeah, yeah. And Visa Pack as well has some carbon features on the suspension, mm -hmm. like the stabilizers, the um, linking, uh, the linking parts of the stabilizer, and the transversal strut between the two uprights mm -hmm. in the back. It's alone five kilos of uh, weight saving mm -hmm. with carbon parts on Visa Package on the suspension. Mm -hmm. you, you get magnesium wheels, yep. which are eight kilos lighter. So, and we have. Uh, Pedals, the shifting pedals, mm -hmm. uh, with a mechanism of the cup car, with yeah. a magnetic mechanism, because click, click, click. Does it just give you a, a kind of crisper yeah. feeling? Yeah, it's yeah. super crisp, and mm -hmm. uh, you hear it now. Mm -hmm. And um, we have uh, the, the door handles in carbon fiber, and uh, mm. the, the stitchings and all that stuff. Is the roll cage in carbon as well? Uh, I would, yeah, the roll cage is carbon fiber as well. Um, on the Visa package, mm -hmm. it has a different geometry. It's not this cross section mm -hmm. that we see here. Uh, it looks a little bit different, uh, very exciting, and uh, it's six kilos lighter than this one. This and in total, with the, with the Visac pack, how much? It's about it? nine. It's it's very roughly 19.4 kilos. <laughs> 19.47192. Um, exactly. That, uh, uh, and that what percentage be of customers? Because look, if you're going to go the whole hog and get the GT3 RS, you know, you're you're probably the person that cares about 19.4 kilograms. So, yeah. what percentage of your customers are going to go for the? What's the your Visac guess? Pack? Well. I'm going to say above 50 percent. Right. Yeah. yeah. Way above. Yeah. Oh really? So we we are, we are curious ourselves, but with the RS models, it's it's way more than mm -hmm. than than 50 percent. It goes even in the 70 percent range, depending on the market. Yeah. Uh, depending on the market. Yeah. And and t uh, it's obviously it's not a limited number of cars. It's mm -hmm. a limited build time. Um, how does it slot in with GT4 and, and GT3, and how long will you make? We them got for? one production line in Sufenhausen, and yeah. we're very busy. 
and uh, we're trying to feed in as much cars as we can. Um, we're prepared to uh, produce cars, not only one a day. Um, I'm sure they won't be enough for everybody. It's yep. always the same, so I don't make any promises here. Uh, but we're trying our best, and uh, we're starting the production in a couple of weeks, yeah. and um, throughout all the next year. And uh, uh, we're doing our best together with our with our suppliers uh, to get enough parts to make enough cars. Sure, but it's obviously a very calculated thing on your part. You know, you could do two production lines and make twice as many cars, but the, for you, is there a sort of fine line between exclusivity and profits? I don't know. I mean, it's, that's not my that's not my uh, um, my role to judge about something like that. I think as uh, always when you have the situation and the, when there's more demand than, than what you can uh, than what you can actually produce, there's this exclusivity thing. Mm -hmm. um, when there's three people and only two cars, it's the same as three thousand and only two thousand nine hundred. Sure. Um, but um, it's 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 not it's not that we that we want to uh, um, yeah to to decrease the number or to 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 keep the numbers in in, in a certain range. We only have the capacity in the comp in the company, and we only have one production line. And we, like I said, we can't just make a second one <laughs> yeah, because we need exactly the same buildings again. Sure, sure. So we're producing at a maximum what we can, what we uh, what we can, what we can pump out. But there's not a limit that we think have in our head that we don't mm -hmm. want to produce more than this and that because we ask the markets how much cars do you think you need, mm -hmm. and then we act according to that and, and trying trying to adjust the production, which sometimes goes wrong because the demand seems to rise from model to model. Mm -hmm. So okay. as well, soon look, as we readjust, there's even more demand than next Well, time. look, whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. And uh, to, to, to see and hear the amount of work that's gone into this car on such, on a level, even the components you can't see are working to get you around that racetrack faster. It's, it's astonishing. It must make your heart bleed um, if a customer buys this car and just parks it up and doesn't drive it. Well, I mean... <laughs> It's up to any. It, it's up. It's up to the customer. Absolutely, this car is made for driving. It's meant. It's meant to get some stone chips. It's meant to get used. Uh, it's meant to produce a lot of fun for the owner, uh, because otherwise we, we could spend like maybe half of the time making it that drivable as it is and 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 and, and that quick as it is. Uh, it seems like a bit of a waste to me sure. if a car is parked only in the garage and getting getting its polish. But we know from the RS customer base, especially the RS customers, 85% of them, they really use their cars on the track. And this is something, this is a quota I can live with. Uh -huh. All right, well, I can't wait to have a go and to drive it properly as you intended. Thank you so much. It's Great been a pleasure. You. Cheers. It is, as you've probably figured out by now, a very, very special bit of kit, this car, and you probably want one. I know that I do, but there are two problems standing in our way. The first is price, it costs around 195,000 pounds, and the second is being lucky enough to get your name on the list for one. But look, if you've got that sort of money burning a hole in your pocket and friends in high enough places, then please do crack on because it's gonna go down in history, this car, the wildest 911 thus far.